Thank you. I'm, I'm glad, uh, Christian, you insisted uh, that I come, uh, because the last time I was here, five years ago, we shared the same panel with Dr. Azayani and uh, Turki El Faisal. And after five years, I looked at the program today, looked at the panels, listened to my friend, Dr. Abdelaziz, and I realized that GRC and its team has jumped from babyhood to adulthood. Diversity of topics, diversity of participants, China, India, Australia, in addition to North America and Europe. Dr. Abdaziz said 86 countries. This is becoming a United Nations, discussing the Gulf. And I want here, before talking to you about the Arab Human Development Report, I want to really salute Dr. Abdelaziz Sager and his team. Somebody who is an example of working so hard, he reminds me of young professors in North America who are applying for tenure. <laughs> he doesn't need tenure. But he is really an example that I would like to see as many in the Arab world. I want you, before I talk, to join me in saluting him. As uh, Christian said, I am a professor of international relations. I have been teaching IR for the last 30 years, essentially theories of international relations. But for the last few years, I have been working in development. Part of it, to be frank, is that the contract that the UN gives you is very tempting, <laughs> financially, and also from the administrative point of view. I mean, they give logistics, infrastructure, organization. You have all the facilities that a researcher dreams of. But there is much more serious reason for going into that project of Arab Human Development Report. What my friend al Zayani talked about and what we analyze as international relations, and I would like really a reaction to this point because it is quite a different philosophical point from what you hear about international relations. What we see about ISIL, about Yemen, about Syria, Egypt, Libya, and Iraq, I submit to you, these are the symptoms. This is what we see. In order to understand them and to cope with them, we have to look at what I call the infrastructure of international relations. And these are the problems of development. If we don't understand or grasp these problems, we will always be dealing with the symptoms. We will fail the diagnosis and certainly fail the prescription. And hence, that is my justification for spending the last few years with the UNDP working on the problems of development. I think the uh, center uh, has put at the table the table of contents and some information on the 10th anniversary Arab Human Development Report. So what I, I, I'll do with you in the 20 minutes or so I am given is really to situate things in context 
and not repeat what we have here. And I'll talk to you about mainly three aspects. One's the context of Arab human development and the publications, which I think are the most significant publications we have on the region in the last 15 years. All of us have written good books, and we are very proud of them. But I can say that these uh, publications of the UN are the most revealing, long before the Arab Spring. And I'll come and say to you why I believe that. So the context, number two, the design and the paradigm. What do we have in the six volumes that we had about the Arab human development in the region? And lastly, the last one, the 10th anniversary one, where I have been the lead author, what does it add? What does it reveal in a context of continuous change? I call it the Middle East, contrary to orientalistic approaches, is it changing, and changing fast. I call it history fast forward. From one day to the other, you see new things. So, in this context, what does the 10th anniversary volume tell us and reveal to us? So let me go uh, briefly and deal with these uh, three points. First of all, the context. You are probably aware that in the year 2000, the UN has adopted one of the important resolutions, we call it MDG, Millennium Development Goals. And for me as an analyst of international relations, I think that is one of the second most important resolutions of the UN after the 1961, where they have decided to end colonialism. The Security Council is going to debate in about two or three weeks an assessment of the Millennium Development Goals and see what have they achieved and where we are heading. And in the process, they have changed slightly from Millennium Development Goals to Sustainable Development Goals, the idea of how to maintain and sustain development. So in that context, the UNDP suggested that we devote a special volume to Arab human development. And the idea was fascinating. You have UN resources, but essentially counting on local experts. And the agreement was that local experts are free. They say whatever they want because they do not represent neither the UN nor the UNDP nor, of course, any government. And I think the first volume, which appeared in 2002, was crucial. It was quoted by lots of leaders because it revealed so much about the region from the inside. Let me just give you a, a short description. In terms of data, it has counted on about 370 background papers. 1,700 pages were represented in these reports tables, statistics, boxes, quotations, field work. As I said, we as academics were very lucky to have all these resources to do our work and not ask us something in return, to express what we believe in. What 
What is the paradigm that came out of that? And you probably heard about it already. The idea that basically the Arab world suffers from three deficits. Deficit in freedom, deficit in knowledge, and the third deficit, inequality. But they defined as a time. We defined equality in rather narrow sense. That is, inequality between men and women. Tell you that in the 10th anniversary volume, we have revised that a little bit and widened the issue. So the paradigm, the idea of deficits. If you have a deficit, if you have a debt, if you have an imbalance, you have to deal with it. Otherwise, you go down the drain. And that's what happened a few years after. You had a crisis, a huge crisis. And what we are having now is a result of not heeding that idea of deficit, of not coping with them. And if you don't cope with them, whatever we do, that will be damage control. You will not solve the problem. So that, that is the main paradigm, main view, if you like, that we work in. Comes the 10th anniversary volume. And the 10th anniversary volume is tricky because you want to recognize the work of your colleagues, what they have done, but at the same time, you do not want to repeat what has been said, especially since the reports have almost dealt and well with everything. And when I negotiated with the UNDP, I said, I'll take one aspect, education. We dealt with everything. The World Bank even picked up from us and published in 2008 an excellent report about education. You look at it, perfect. What do you need to add? We'll just repeat. But at the same time, I felt I really agonized. How can you publish a 10th anniversary volume on development without dealing with education? It is the basis of everything. And so I went to the UNDP and I said, I have a solution. In most of the studies of education we have on the Arab world, one important sector is rather neglected ignored, religious education. What Al-Azhar does was the different schools in Saudi Arabia and the madrasa in Pakistan do, and these have been, in a sense, completely ignored. The UNDP got scared, said we cannot touch that. We deal with religious education as if we are criticizing religion. And we'll have people in the street attacking our offices. And I promise that what we will do, we will actually treat it as professionally as possible. And in the 10th anniversary volume, you have two chapters on religious education. One on basic religious education, by a Tunisian colleague, excellent, about the problems and the solutions. And another chapter by a colleague from Bahrain about the formation of imams and priests. These are the people actually who influence society. If I go with an imam, half educated, in the Egyptian countryside, people will listen to him more than they listen to me. 
And if these guys are not well educated, we go down the tree. ISIL is part of that. Lots of them even pretend they are imams. So you have two chapters there that I'm very proud of. We elaborated long before anybody talked about renewing or revising religious education. One other aspect, and here perhaps my friend, Mr. al Zayani would not be agreeing with me, is that looked again at our previous reports, lots of things about conflict. But conflict with Israel and with the US, fine. These are important conflicts. But it is again repeated all the way. And again, I came to the UNDP and said, if we want to add something, we have to talk about other conflicts, inter-Arab conflicts. And again, the reaction was very strong. I said, it can be an idea for the Arab League if the Arab League decides to wake up to establish an early warning system. We have differences between Algeria and Morocco. We cannot ignore that. Borders between Algeria and Morocco for the last 50 years have been closed for about 43 years. As academics, we cannot ignore this aspect. You have conflicts, even when El Ba'ath was governing in Iraq and Syria, you have differences between these two countries. We have to deal with them. So that is another, I think, uh, asset, and perhaps in the end, the UNDP accepted these issues, but in the end, they hesitated to put their logo on the report and said, you publish the report, we support you, we would admit that, but we don't want people to confuse what you say and what the UNDP believes. And that, that, that was fine, that was fine. Let me come to one last important point. The definition of development. And again, you look not only at the Gulf, but at the whole region of the Middle East. And you realize that this region is very rich in resources financial and the human. Much more endowed than many parts in Asia. And yet, you see the problems that my friend Al Zayani was talking about. Why is this gap? Huge element of resources and the stalled development. Arrested development. And we reach the point, again, pushed hard, is that development, in fact, I would like to have your reaction on that. Development is not a function of resources. It is a function of policies. How to use these resources? We have countries that don't have any resources. Japan is one, and yet they are very developed. So, the positive side of this aspect of defining development as such is that development is not a destiny. Misdevelopment or underdevelopment is not a fate. It is a policy that can be corrected. And hence, you open the way to change the situation. In the end, because the World Bank and the UNDP are very fetish about a new concept that they call governance, they accepted that idea. I think they realized it fits into what they are preaching. But then when we looked at the concept of governance, and it is important, it is relevant, 
I said to them, I have some doubts about just using the concept of governance. Because governance is capacity building, and that is very important. But if you are dealing with development, you have to deal with the different groups in society. There is an element of power involved. People at the top have to realize that they have to include people below. And there is a need to restructure power. And the essential starting point is that the people at the top have to realize that development has to be inclusive. You cannot just decide without consulting with the different echelons of society. That would lead us to the problems that we have now. It's told development. And I borrowed from medical sciences the term CNS, Central Nervous System. This is where governance is a problem. It has to be the solution. And this is where we start. How to encourage people to be partners in an overall process of development. So we dealt, obviously, with problems like the rule of law. Strong chapter there. Chapter about corruption. And the barriers to development. Conflict, inter-Arab conflicts. And the fact that the Arab world doesn't have a mode of conflict resolution. They have to accept the idea that people differ. And when we differ, how can we settle these differences? You can differ, and it is a scale. Friends can differ. How to prevent differences from being an outright hostility and war? And how to reach a point where you can have an early warning system? Very good. An early warning system where you can prevent conflicts from becoming an all-out war. Let me, just in the two minutes that are left, say what, what does the 10th anniversary volume add to uh, the problems of development and how to get out. Because our objective was to find solutions. It was not a purely academic exercise. And mind you, when we started the 10th anniversary volume, we were in May 2010. We saw that there are problems, but we never have an idea about what will be called later the Arab Spring. Three important points, perhaps, that come out from the 10th anniversary volume. One, contrary to conventional wisdom, there isn't what we call Arab exceptionalism. That the whole world is changing, except the Arab world. On the contrary, if you look at society, Society is changing and fast. And part of the problem is that people at the top, usually old people, staying in power for a long time, didn't understand what was taking place at the bottom. If you remember Zain al-Abdin bin Ali of Tunisia, when he had the problems, he kept on repeating to his people, Fihim tokum. I understood you. But he did not understand. Mubarak said the same thing. He did not understand. So there is that problem of the gap between top and bottom. Top is stagnant. Bottom is changing and changing fast. Number two. I have data here about youth and the problems of youth that our governments 
didn't take into consideration. Number two, problem of inequality, dominant in the Arab region. Not only between oil producing countries and other countries. I mean, the income of the Qatari citizen is 50 times the income of the Yemeni. But much more serious within the different societies. I live in Cairo. 17% of the Egyptian population live in slums, in formal housing. 40% of the people are at the border of the poverty line, $2 a day. And at the same time, around the American University, you see gated communities with golf and swimming pools and lots of Mercedes cars, Jaguars, and even 4x4 hammer that I cannot afford myself. <laughs> so that is, that is a dimension of inequality. So high, it becomes provocative. Number three, and I finish there. And it is really addressed to you as researchers. Democracy is the solution. It is not Islam the solution. Democracy is the solution. But we as analysts have been lazy. We have been copying from the outside a sort of mimicry, talking about human rights, political parties, all empty shells, instead of trying to not only to adopt, but adapt a way of democratizing government and society, of thinking out of the box, of being innovative. And this is really the challenge for you here, especially my young colleagues, how to adapt and transplant, not transfer, democracy to be convenient process of governance in the Arab world. Democracy and social justice were the slogans that the Arab street has revolted for, and I hope when we come next time in GRC, if I'm invited, <laughs> that me and my friend Dr. Al Zayani will be celebrating ourselves about some achievements at this level. Thank you very much. <laughs>